Hello everyone and welcome back to our final session, our session 3 of Envivo. And today we're looking at how to get our themes that we've generated into our text and how we present that in our work. For those who have not been along from the start, my name is Dr Anthony Cliff. And so far we've discussed in session 1 how to transcribe in Envivo. And then in session 2 how to code that data to generate themes. So today I'm going to use some uh, data that I used for from my PhD for a paper that I wrote. So I'm going to be focused on one particular theme and then sub-themes and then talk through how I presented that as a paper. Okay, so at this point you should have transcribed, you've coded, you've, you've done everything, you've done all the hard work, you've got all your themes into codes and you'll have something that looks a little bit like this. So here is all my different uh, themes for my large project, but today I'm just going to focus on my UAV themes, and particularly on the advantages and the disadvantages. So this is where themes are really good. So this is why we generate themes, we make sense of our data. So I did uh, a couple of interviews and focus groups. Uh, I'm looking at effectively how UAVs can be used um, in education and particularly on fieldwork for geographers. So how do I make sense of all that data then? Well, typically what you've just done, I went through and coded all my data as we did in session two, and I've gone about and I've put them into, into themes. Now themes you can kind of think about as, um, as a story, as chapters in a story, um, and certainly in research. So, yeah, UAVs is the book, as it were, or in this case, the, the paper. The first half is all about the advantages, and particularly in focusing on um, the perceived benefits of that, which is the different perspectives on fieldwork, and particularly how UAVs can be really useful as a data collection tool. Now, as qualitative researchers, it's your job to tell the story of the participants. So you're going to use their data to generate a narrative. But of course, when you have so many different interviews with different conflicting views at times, how do you make sense of that data? How do you come about describing the data? How do you make the story? There's two ways to go about it. Typically, you can have a look here, for example. Um, so I have, um, so I know I'm going to talk about the advantages of UAVs. That's going to obviously going to be one of my selling points. One of the things I'm really going to talk about is how it can offer a different perspective on field work that typically you can't get with any other typical type of equipment that they use on field work. Now, as you see here, I had six interviewees out of the seven who mentioned that, and it came up 11 different times throughout those different interviews. So you could base your discussions on the most populous here, um, or obviously because you've gone through and you've done all the interviews yourselves and you've transcribed them, you may find that actually there might be something that pops up a little bit less frequently but is a bit more of a powerful story to come about. But it just so happens that what I find is the most powerful about UAVs is what's actually come out the most in uh, my discussions with my participants. So that's the story I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell a story about advantages of UAVs and I'm going to pull in typically about it, offering a different perspective on fieldwork has been a really important and valuable aspect to that. So if I double click on that, that little theme there, that will pull up all the data of people who've discussed that in my work. Okay, so now I have all the quotes from my different participants who mentioned some form of capacity, how UAVs offer that different perspective on fieldwork. So how do you go about doing this? How do you go about putting this into your work? Well, obviously, it's impractical to give every single participant you have a voice for that particular theme. It's also impractical to simply just copy and paste their entire quote, throw it into your research, and then leave it at that and don't mention anything else to it at all. That's not how we do things. Now, if I pop into my uh, file, which I'm going to talk about today, so I wrote a paper based off this data about the evaluation of the introduction of unmanned aerial vehicles for teaching and learning in geoscience fieldwork. And that was published um, in the summer of uh, 2019. And I basically used that data, uh, which I'm going to talk through today, to put that into my work. So obviously, typically, it has an abstract introduction. I'm going to ignore all of that for now. But what we are going to focus on is how I put that into, 
into my work. So for the results and discussion then, obviously I was talking about the pros and the cons to using UAVs. So first and foremost, I'm talking about the advantages. So if I go back into my file, we see here the advantages, all this data here is all about the advantages that UAVs offered my participants and their students in fieldwork. And then I've broke that down into what I feel um, is the different themes. So certainly here, the perceived benefits, we had um, offers a different perspective on fieldwork. Someone said it's good for marketing and that it's interactive. Here, as we see here, 40 times uh, any mention about the UAV being able to collect data came up. So that's definitely a talking point that I want to talk about. I want to talk about fieldwork, and I also want to talk about the advantages of using data from a UAV in fieldwork, that data collection. And as we see here, 18 methods of data collection, we have high resolution imagery, and then access of data for inaccessible locations. So out of all that, the inaccessible uh, locations I find is a really powerful um, is a very powerful message that comes out from my participants about why UAVs are good on fieldwork. Okay, so as I mentioned there, I found that really quite powerful. I looked through all my data and I found that actually, yeah, that what they're all discussing, which is effectively the same thing, that it offers them a different perspective of the landscape. Typically, they mentioned it being a bird's eye view or different connotations of that. So, how do you go about putting that into your work? Well, you can't just throw a quote in there. You have to intertwine it with your words and your it's your story. It's how you write and how you intertwine their different uh, types of quotes to put in there. So, I'm going to talk you through the different types of ways of doing that. And typically, I've used both here. The first one is where... As you're writing, as your narrative, you intertwine the participant's voice into your narrative. So, so here, this particular one, again, I was focusing on, it's a different perspective of a landscape. All of my participants said that in some form or other, but I've chosen, particularly lecturer B, who offers some really powerful words to support that, that notion that it is a different perspective on fieldwork. So this is how I've gone about doing it then. So... So my text, uh, as I'm writing it, I basically said, lecturers in this study cited that UAVs could be a valuable tool in helping their students to gain a different perspective of the field location. So that is based off all of my interviews. They've all said that in some form of capacity. So I'm just summarising that and then telling the reader that that is what they've said. Now to support that, I'm giving a quote. So lecturer B believes that... And then here you open your um, speech marks. Typically, I um, I put mine in italics. Makes it stand out a little bit better. So a lecture would be in relation there to what I've just said about a different perspective. They said that studying landscapes is really hard when you're studying it because the landscape is massive and you can't see a lot of the morphology features because they're such a big scale. So now to break the quote up, I've then added my own prose in again. He then goes on to say that, and then open up my speech marks again. You can see their form and shape and morphology more easily from above than you can on the ground. So now he's starting to support what I'm saying up above. And then finally, therefore, he believes that. And now this is the real key quote, and this is the really punch that I want my reader to read and really take away from that, is that a drone has the potential to utterly transform the way in which you teach and understand a landscape. So now that really does support what I'm saying. So all lecturers have said that, and in lecture B, this particular one has the most powerful quote to really support that. Now it's up to you. Obviously, I had plenty of different quotes I could have used, but this final one here, the way that this lecturer said it, is utterly transform the way in which you teach and understand the landscape. Well, that's fundamental. That is the big thing that I want to shout about. That's what I want other people reading this research to really get. So I had to look through that data, find that, and then that's really important because that's the quote that I wanted people to pull out. So moving on from that then, the other way to put this in is to use blocks. So if you have 40 words or less, you can intertwine them. If it's 40 words or more, you have to indent them like I have here underneath. 
So what's really important in qualitative research is not only to rely on one participant, is to bounce off each other. So here, in my next little paragraph, I'm discussing how, um, yeah, UAVs are great for transforming um, the way you teach because it's this bird's eye view. However, lecturer E offers a really good example, a typical example that a geographer may face, how a UAV can benefit them and they give their own personal opinion. And that's really good because it's bouncing off each other. So, so in my own prose then, I've said that the different bird's eye view perspectives can be utilised for specific fieldwork environments. So as we discussed above, it can offer a bird's eye view. Now I'm giving an example. So while lecturer B talked about the generic use of UAVs offering this bird's eye view, lecturer E offered a specific fieldwork environment example where UAVs can offer that distinct advantage for students. So now I'm saying, okay, lecture B is give this, lecture E is going to support that claim. So it's really hands in my, my argument. So it's often impractical due to time pressures of field work to study an entire ripper profile. So that particular thing has come from my previous research in my lit review. So therefore, this lecturer argues that utilising a UAV allows students to gain that more in-depth understanding and context of a river system, which cannot be currently get on field work. So I'm basically arguing for the use of UAVs here based off the back of these two things. And now here is a block quote that I've put in. So you may see things in brackets. So obviously this is part of a conversation. This is part of an interview. So they're not mentioning drones by name, but certainly that's what the question's been. So they have said effectively, yeah, it's great looking at channel morphology. But what I need to know, the reader needs to know that it's about UAVs. And here, in their prose, they've said it's great looking at channel morphology. I feel it's better having four, because we're implying that UAVs is for that. So any words that you put in which isn't the participants' words to make it read a little bit better goes in brackets. So UAVs, it's great for looking at channel morphology and looking at how morphology changes. All of that is fantastic. I'm thinking particularly about the trip down to the River Dee. That's quite a dynamic area. So here... Um, she is starting to add in um, bits of their own personal opinion um, and outlining the location. So if you're a geographer reading this, you could really appreciate, to me it's quite often a trip that geographers will go on, looking at river studies, they can equate their own personal experiences to what this participant has looked at. She then goes on to say, this is a really straight section, and there's loads of meandering sections, so to show the change, to give them that more, it's just a bit of water here, and it's just a straight bit of river there. You can get a long perspective, which you can't get normally. So all of that is supporting my prose above. And because I, this was part of a mixed method study, I then went on to support all of this data with some hard facts and figures from my questionnaires. So typically, as I said here, this overview can potentially provide students with an extra piece of data to enhance their fieldwork experience. Students, when asked in the questionnaire how they would like UAVs to be used on fieldwork, the two most popular answers were to collect pictures of a field site and to collect videos. And then here is the hard facts and figures from my questionnaire. So that's fine. We've talked about the different um, uh, elements of that. My next one. If I go back to my themes, the next one I wanted to discuss was this one, collecting data from inaccessible locations. Now, this is something that literature suggests that is a useful tool, and so that's what came out of my interviews. So that's something else I want to write about. So reading through all of their little transcripts here and the things that I've coded, typically the most common thing that came up was about accessing data from places that students necessarily couldn't go, be that from a river system or from a glacier. And they all give different examples. So again, I just picked, I'm going to summarise all that, and then I'm going to pick some of the best quotes to really support that. So again, accessing data from inaccessible locations is my subheading, and I'm going to use all that data that's presented there already to put that into my work. So, as I've said here, as fieldwork is a vital learning tool by getting students to visit locations, sometimes due to health and safety and risk management, which is an increasing barrier for fieldwork, some locations cannot be accessed. So again, this is all part of my lit review, so I'm linking back to my lit review, and also this is exactly what all my participants have said. I'm just summarising what they've said. 
So students may be in an area important for their study, but they may not be maximising their time out in that field due to access restrictions. On field work without UAVs, this area of land and any potential data would not have been collected or viewed by the students for learning. This changes with the introduction of UAV technology. All lecturers mention the UAV being a valuable tool in being able to enter inaccessible locations to collect data. So, I'm presenting a problem and now I'm presenting a solution by UAVs can offer. Which again makes it a lot more powerful, you work a lot more powerful when you're trying to solve things. And as I mentioned here, all lecturers mentioned that it was useful in being able to collect that data from inaccessible locations. So then I mentioned here, well, one lecture outlines how using the technology opens up far more learning and data collection opportunities for his students on fieldwork. When he goes on to explain, and here I'm not going to read it out, but he explains how that is really beneficial. And then similarly, um, adding other extra bits of data in there. Um, so, you know, how quick it is, all that data is supporting and interwining. So, for example, lecture C, high temporal and spatial resolutions, just throwing that in there. Um, and then I had a different lecturer here who again supported that. So that's how you go about doing it. That's how you intertwine your quotes uh, into your work. Now, obviously, it's important for you first and foremost to understand what your narrative is going to be. What's your story? Work out what your story is going to be first and foremost. Read back through all your quotes. Get a general sense of what everyone is saying. And then it's up to you to pick out what you think is the most powerful quotes. Now, typically, you may find that, for example, this is quite a particularly long quote here. Um, let's have a look. This one is a really long quote. You may only pick a couple of sentences out. So I might use an example here, use an ellipsis, and then use another couple of uh, words from this other part that they've said. You can mix and match the quotes as long as it's saying the words, as long as you're not changing what they mean. That's really important. Now, it's quite useful. It's great if all your participants agree. So here, all my participants are talking about one thing. It makes it a really powerful tool for me to discuss. But that's not necessarily a bad thing if they do disagree. So, for example, here, I was discussing about how they can uh, be really useful drones to collect data from inaccessible locations. Now, if half of my participants said it would, or part, half of them said it wouldn't, that's still really good to put in there. Because I could say, for example, well, lecturer A believes it would be really useful to collect data in such a way, insert quote. However, lecturer B disagrees. He believes that it won't be very efficient because, insert quote, and then this could be because, and then you describe potentially is it due to their job role, is it due to their experiences, you know, that kind of stuff. You can start then analysing your data a little bit more, giving the reader a potential explanation of why they've come up with that particular thing. Some of the things to note is typically um, you want to discuss with your face what you want to do. Obviously, your methods is important to explain to the reader how you've gone about it. So, particularly, I did some thematic analysis from Braun and Clark. Um, but also, you want to describe your participants. So, so here, this is really important. So, I was discussing UAVs, and obviously, the reader wants to know: well, out of all those people that you've studied. You know, how many of them are qualified? How many of them have experience in UAVs? Um, so here I'm basically saying, well, some of them had no experience, some had 25. And of those who did have experience, A, B, and C, they'd only flown them for research purposes and not for teaching. And importantly, none of them were fully approved UK Civil Aviation Authority license holders. And therefore that can affect basically their views. So that was really important for them to mention that. So the reader gets a handle on who my group are like what's the what's the population i'm looking at so that's all you do you go through structure it the way i have here so i have my advantages and my disadvantages and then i picked out some of the key things there for my little subheadings and obviously it's not all good um there's also about the negatives as well so typically the negatives of that is all about um, how some of the here the barriers. So looking back here, these are my disadvantages or barriers, as it were. Laws and licensing were the massive thing. Um, the inexperience as well was also another. So I go about discussing that here. So my number one was laws and licensing. So bringing in 
uh, quotes, bringing in my own prose, using different lectures to really support that idea. So, yeah, really going through. Malpractice is another one, concern of time investment. That's all come out of my themes. Putting that in there, and then here, you know, putting in some uh, quotes and some literature to support their ideas, really important. And then finally, having that conclusion and then acknowledgements, etc. So that's how you go about doing all of this, really important. So finally, one other things to look out for. If you've done thematic analysis, this should be relatively straightforward. Now, sometimes you may well find that you remember someone has said something particular about a particular thing, but it might not necessarily be in the theme that you think it should be, and you can't quite find it. Now, quite often, this will happen where you're like, oh, I know that someone said something about this, but I can't remember quite what it is. So if you go to explore and then text search, you can actually search for by word throughout your whole data set. So let's just say oh, I knew someone said something about UAVs being practical, but I couldn't remember who said it. So I type practical in the search bar. If I know it's definitely practical is what they said, leave that as is. But you can change this to different things. Say if you want someone talking about flooding, so you might put flood in there, and you might change this to STEM word. So not only flooding will come up, but also flood, flooding, floods, that kind of stuff. Now if I click run query, it'll take a little while. And there we go, now it pops up that these are all my different people who... Um, have some reference so here this particular person mentioned practical six times and if I go to my focus group double click on that that will load up and as you can see the term practical is highlighted and I can see in what context there um, so again if you don't know if you can't remember exactly who said it or you want to find a particular word or you find it's really important to put it in there use that function that is really useful uh, something else that you can do as well is about word frequencies. So if you wanted to create um, a word cloud of what's the most common thing that's been said, then typically if you're doing content analysis, it's something that you'll do. So minimum length, I'm going to have four words, uh, sorry, four letters. I'm going to be exact. You can change all of these and this all runs different type of things. Click run query. And then here you can see, for example, yeah pops up 608 times throughout my entire um, uh, interview schedules and then you can change these different things so this particular one here this will run stuff so for example if you have students um, it will pull in data that's related to that so typically such as um, postgrad or undergrad that kind of stuff it's quite a clever system pulling all that together um, and you can make a word cloud from that. And as you see here, now that pulls through all that, so you can see different types of things there. You can double click on that, that'll take you to exactly where that's being said. You can also generate a word cloud. Not as common anymore in research, although they used to be. Although it can be quite a useful tool sometimes to kind of demonstrate and show what your participants have said. The bigger and bolder, the more times it's come up. And then the smaller it is, the least or the, the less times that it's popped up. Quite useful. Um, here you can just pick, for example, you might have just what's the top 20 words. Um, run that. So if you wanted, say if your question was about um, what are the effects of, of flooding, for example, on your participants, you can pick 20 most frequent and see what's the 20 most frequent times that's popped up from that particular question. So, really useful. Say so it takes a little while to generate. There we go. Um, so it's a little bit easier to pop up and find that kind of stuff. Um, and to do that, you can select particular people. Uh, you can select particular cases, um, or you can do uh, the whole entire data set. So it's up to you, depending on how you will go about doing it. So that's all there is. That's all there is to it to get it into your research, into your work. Make sure that you put your introduction in. Make sure you've done a methodology. Make sure you're using um, supporting literature to support what your
participants are saying and what your conclusions are and obviously make sure that you put your conclusions in there. So thank you for following uh, these past three sessions. Do make use of other tutorials online. Um, this is just about how to do it thematically. If you do want to have a read of this paper properly to see how I've done it, how I've used the mixed method study, then please do type this into Google Scholar and then follow the links there or the DUI number. Follow that and then that'll take you there. Have a read, see how I've intertwined my um, my data, my questionnaire data, my interview data, and how I've made it into that little story that typically research is. Qualitative research is about that story. Uh, please subscribe. I'll also be making some more videos. The next one will be about how to go about designing a lit review and how you go about doing that. So, and I'll be doing other researchy type things as well in the future. So, yeah, thank you very much um, and goodbye for now.